in a world where Microsoft virtualization is still considered to be the underdog by some. The Hyper-V Amigos enlighten the IT crowds on how they could very well be mistaken. So, this is the fourth episode of the Hyper-V Amigos and uh, this time we are shared with the two other missing Hyper-V Amigos. Uh, Didier and I are here, of course, and now you see Aiden Finn in the upper left corner and uh, Hans Redort in the upper right corner. And uh, guys, uh, for the listener or the viewer who don't know you, maybe a short introduction who you are. Hi, I'm Aiden Finn. You may know me from Twitter as at Joe underscore Elway. Um, I'm a Hyper-V MVP like the others. And in the past, I've written a few books with uh, guys like Hans and Patrick Vance and Damien Flynn and others. And I contribute around the Petri IT knowledge base, writing about Microsoft virtualization. And I blog on my own site. And that would come. Support from, uh, as you can see, the Netherlands. Um, We had a great win last night, so <laughs> that's why I'm dressed like this. Um, I am blog at hyperv.new. Um, I am also the. Uh, uh, start, I started the uh, Windows Azure Pack Wiki, which has become quite popular. Uh, I've been uh, an author as well, as Aiden said, and I also reviewed a couple of his books. Um, and I'm in. During the day, I, I work as a, as a consultant in private clouds and hybrid clouds. Okay, great. And uh, now the question is, why are we the original Hyper-V Amigos? As it has to do something with uh, the game last night. Uh, the Netherlands won against Spain. And uh, Hans told us uh, before this, this was a revenge for, the f uh, <coughs> for a loss you had four years ago at the... Uh, we am uh, uh, we am final. Ago, we lost the final from Spain. <laughs> okay, and now you 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 beat them uh, quite uh, with a high number. I, I I read five to one. Is it right? Con congratulations. Exactly. <laughs> so what has They it to do? They must have had a really bad night. <laughs> <laughs> what has it to do with Spain? The Hyper V amigos. <laughs> so who who wants to to I tell our started, viewers? Yeah. Well, Didier. Didier, maybe. Okay, so, in 2011, we were doing a two-day masterclass series uh, within the, the experts conference by Quest. It was in Barcelona, so that's Spain. And we were thinking about how do we introduce the entire group of us to the audience. We should have a catchy name. I don't remember all the proposals anymore, but I do remember that Hans was the one who is responsible for the idea of Hyper-V Amigo. Uh, I, I remember sure. that also. Clear memories of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we are important. So this conference was in Spain. The four of us were there and uh, presenting. And also, I think, Nicolas from Sweden is also MVP now. Yes, and yeah. uh, yeah. and uh, we were presenting and we had a big crowd uh, that was very interested about Hyper-V. And uh, from there on, it started very well. Now Hyper-V is uh, a mainstream, I would think. Huh? What would you say? Yeah, absolutely. It's, the, uh, it's growing. Whereas it's, it's, other certain V products, their market share is actually starting to slide, according to IDC. Yeah, I saw a slide with over 30%, uh, I think, market share. I don't know if it's true, but uh, it's it's definitely growing, I think. Well, I think today you would have... In 2011, it was kind of special to be able to do a two-day uh, track of Hyper-V, just on Hyper-V. Yeah. And I remember we were really talking about all the new stuff that was... Uh, And it's about yeah, 2012. Yep. And now, now if you do a session on Hyper-V, lift and ball game. Lots of more attendees, lots of interests. It's uh, it's definitely growing. That's for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So, but there is another thing we want to talk about. Uh, it it um, has nothing to do with Spain. It's had, it has to do with the US. Uh, the three of you were so fortunate to be at TechEd North America 2014. I couldn't be there <laughs> and uh, I saw a lot of great tweets uh, about the TechEd 2014 and I, I was a little bit envy. So, I want to talk a little bit about your ex, uh, impressions from TechEd 2014. How was the keynote? How was the conference at all? And I know Didier and Aiden has to tell us something special that happened there. Yes, I <laughs> I think of, on the presentations, Didier, you were on stage with, uh, w with another guy from Microsoft and Aiden won something. So maybe we talk about that later, but... Aiden, Aiden, did, some, Aiden did something really amazing. <laughs> yeah. And you were also, I think, your first TechEd presentation, no? That was, yes, that was kind of a... Yeah, an opportunity. Let's, let's put it that way. Yeah. So, uh, who you wants to? Somebody else in the UTDA. You were saying? You filled in for somebody else. Yes, uh, actually, both of us. Both of us. Actually, mm -hmm. not not neither Ben nor I had a session. It was supposed to be Jeff Woolsey's yeah, session, wasn't it? Yeah. Jeff yeah. So there was a there was a, a slot to be filled, and we we rose to the occasion. Now I'll, I'll put it that way. And you filled it quite well. You did some nice demos uh, over the internet on your home lab, I think. Not your home lab, your... No. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately... <laughs> uh, uh, I always wonder where the great stuff is uh, yeah, is placed on the on the right or on the left. This side, this side, is it in your room? Oh? All the servers are standing there. Uh, did he ask <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, Didier is compelling just behind that brown door beside his bed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you did a session with uh, Ben Armstrong and uh, I watched it. It's, it was really great. You showed a lot of good demos about the cool features in Hyper-V. And uh, Aiden, maybe you, you tell us what you won. Um, I won Speaker Idol. Speak. Um, <laughs> You yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a competition um, yeah. match of some of these, you know, singing competitions on TV. Yeah. And that's, you know, clog up our Saturday nights. Um, so a number of non-speakers at TechEd are invited to compete and deliver five-minute presentations over different qualifying rounds, and then the top speakers go to, to a final. And the winner of the final wins a speaking slot at the TechEd North America of 2015. And um, I was lucky enough to win the final. Luck? Yeah, so I've got a speaking slot next it's year. Talent, my dear friend. Uh, <laughs> I think, was it luck? I mean, no, really. Um, I mean, really, really, it was not luck. It was pure talent because you really have to, you, you have to realize something. Giving a presentation, a quality presentation in five minutes, It's something I would not even dare to attempt, and I it, must it say, rough. really, it's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, you, it that's, was what rough. You, that's what you can do for a presentation training courses. Uh, <laughs> just five minutes. Uh, and... Oh, five minutes is rough. Like when you think about it, um, you know, each of us has given lots of presentations. You know, if we were asked to do a, a, an hour-long presentation, <coughs> it would take us very little time to do that five hour-long presentation preparation. The five minutes where you've got in introduction, tell them and tell them what you're telling them. Do the demo and then tell them what you told them. Be funny and be entertaining. Oh, and on you have a lot of minutes. supporters, of course. That's oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, want, I, yeah. I, I don't get nervous doing presentations anymore. You know, I've done presentations to five people and a thousand people, but I was so nervous when I did that one. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Wow, there in there um, yeah, uh, yeah it, it was it was weird looking down and seeing all these people I know standing at the back cheering me on. Um, so it was, as soon as I looked down when I was doing my preparation, I was like, okay, I've got to do something to take advantage of this. 
So I was like, okay, how is everybody? And just waved my arms. And everybody just screamed. It was like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> that was my advantage over the other speakers. Um, it was both cool and nerve-wracking all at the same time. So hopefully I'll get on a stage like this year. And, um, hopefully I won't. Um, I'll make a mess. <laughs> you have plenty of time to prepare now. I, I think yeah. I think you did the hard part already. <laughs> Five minutes. Amazing. You have to tell something significantly interesting in a, in a way that people get it and take value from that and salute you, sir. <laughs> so it's, the 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 thing that I the, the, the thing that I used the most was advice I got from Mark Manassi last year. And Mark told me that when you're doing something like Speaker Idol, you have to remember that two of the judges are IT pros and two of the judges are developers. Hmm. And you have to give both sides of the audience a reason to be interested. And I'm going to do a segue here to move us on with the, uh, the podcast. That would have been something that would have been useful in the keynote at TechEd. Because we saw halfway through the keynote, they did a hard switch from all IT pro content to developer content. Mm -hmm. I was sitting in the press section, and I looked around. I saw a lot of people leaving. Now, the figures I heard this week from some Microsoft people is that they think about 500 people walked out of that keynote at, that during those 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And... That's something, you know, there was a very hard, it was very hard, here's all the cool stuff in Azure for IT pros, and now we're switching over to talk about Visual Studio. Oh, and let's watch a guy writing code in Visual Studio, which is like the death knell for any presentation, to be quite honest. <laughs> um, it's a kiss of death for any presentation. Uh, 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 if I was a developer still, I'd be bored. Uh, uh. And watching someone type. And then there was the 20 um, minutes of office spam at a three times normal speed <laughs> to, to finish off the keynote. I mean, that was that was the office, final kill. Office 365 uh, on speed. Oh, that was like. Um, and I remember the tweets. She was enthusiastic. Was tweeting, we'll say that for you know, <laughs> Or very nervous. I don't know what it was. <laughs> the tweets. Yeah. The tweets said it all. She's going to pass out due to lack of breathing. <laughs> be nice but guys be tweet, nice those, those tweets kept coming for yeah over 10 to 15 minutes it was like yeah yeah like there was a lot of good stuff that was announced there um you know uh dda sees the great value in something like Ex express route and we all see the value or the potential site recovery to have economic secondary site based on IP replica um, albeit with the requirement of having System Center Virtual Machine Manager on premise to uh, help coordinate that uh, replication. Um, what else did we see in there that was very cool? Uh, the new remote app functionality where you can run remote desktop services from Azure. Very cool stuff was announced. Also, the, uh, the uh, some of the security review, stuff. Uh, that one, one was yeah. So yeah, so that will be uh, useful for. Yeah, for applications yeah. that need a single content store. And um, the security side for Office 365 and where they're going with that was very interesting. Yeah. Um, trying to defeat the efforts of the likes of the NSA and the FBI. Um, and let's not forget the European agencies who are doing just the same things. Yes. And um, so it was a very interesting content, but it wasn't necessarily delivered in a good way. And I, and I got a sense that there was a lot of disappointment that there were no on-premise announcements for Windows Server and System Center and, you know, the win next version of Windows 9. Well, let's call it, it Windows 9. And also the yeah. System Center and, and yeah. Windows are all developed together. Even Azure Pack is, is developed in the same cycle. Much to tell. We have to wait some more time for that. Exactly. What the development cycle is it's every 12 to 18 months um, you know the rumors are out there that it's all going to be released or RTM in April of next year so May of 2014 was way too early 
to get any previews or mm. announcements. Mm. But I think people saw the build conference a month beforehand where there was some talk about the next version of Windows Client and where they were going universal apps and where they were going with the UI. And there's been some hints about the single UI for our, or single OS for ARM processor devices and stuff like that. And they were hoping there might be a bit more. Um, but like you said, it's too early. Um, Did anybody think that the integration of, uh, let's say, MMS into Tech Head was a success? I haven't seen it really. Um, there weren't weren't all that many uh, yeah. tech uh, system center sessions. Yeah. That even uh, we we actually decided uh, with a couple of MVPs to 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 use the Friday uh, to have uh, a, a tech at day five. Uh, there was a user group in Houston, uh, the, uh, the Houston area management user group. And so we came together and uh, we we did two two tracks of all system center um, Windows Azure pack sessions which was, was quite nice. So we feel that in ourselves. So Karsten, what was it like from your perspective watching it remotely? Yeah, I was surprised. Uh, I, I think it, it was not so bad. Um, and I was surprised about the massive Azure, Azure things. So uh, I got the impression Microsoft is thinking everybody is already in the cloud. And uh, that's not true for... A lot of customers in, in, in Germany, I think it's maybe the same in your countries, but uh, we are not there al already. And uh, I got the impression Microsoft thinks everybody is in the cloud already. Or um, the Azure things were interesting. And yeah. I want to ask you about your opinion about the site recovery manager. Uh, and also uh, Hans mentioned the SMB stuff in, uh, in Azure. I wonder it's only SMB 2.1. I, I, I got the impression why they it do is. it. Yeah, it is. Yeah, why 2.1? Two, two they are already on uh, Windows Server 2012. It's it's not uh, SMB3 storage. It was, it's probably related to whatever the, the back-end storage is of Azure. And let's face it, we have no idea what that is. Yeah. And they don't talk about that. Um, but the purpose of this file share storage, it isn't for storing virtual machines or databases or anything like that. It is for content, for example, you're running a, a web farm and you want to have a single repository of web content. Okay. You'd store it on one of these SME 2.01 or SME 2.1 or whatever it is, all the shares, and configure I did. Since it's the point Something like the SME and this single repository. No, it's, it, and it kind of sounded like SMB3 storage in the keynote. Um, it wasn't until afterwards when we went and talked to people that we found out exactly yeah. what it was. Okay. Um, so there was a bit of misleading there, um, but that comes down to keynotes. Keynotes are there to give you headlines and not to give you technical details. There were a couple of interesting um, details that Mark Rusinovich uh, told us uh, in the Mark and Mark session for being there as well. Yeah, okay. And what he said was that um, the, quite a large part of, of Azure is uh, still on the um, on the branch of Windows Server 2012, so the Hyper-V is also the uh, version of the 2012 version, and they're currently building or uh, upgrading parts of it, or maybe the new parts. They will be, they will be on the Hyper-V version 2012 R2. So, if, for example, we cannot have any yeah. uh, VHDX at the moment. One, that's probably one my, one of I'm my not sure why that I need that to make it sure feasible for me. Yeah, you need them. Yeah, but maybe when when uh, R two is uh, um, being uh, shipped on 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 the new servers in Azure, that will be a possibility mm -hmm. in the future. So the I other thing, so. the other thing Carson brought up there was you know the of public cloud like like AWS or Azure. Um, it is still very low. I think the early adopters have been developers. What we're seeing here in Ireland is the Microsoft partners, so the, the, the consulting companies, are rushing to learn and um, they're attending training events like crazy. Um, even a number of partners have purchased enterprise agreements so they can resell blocks of Azure. That should be interesting, especially come August 1st when you know Microsoft partners can actually sell Azure credit. Uh, through open okay, licensing, yeah, yeah. so yeah, so I think uh, 
that will be another interesting side of things. At least here in Ireland, Office 365 has opened up the doorway to public cloud. But we uh, we've just found out recently that we you know we're one of the top uh, countries in all of Microsoft worldwide in terms of adoption of Office 365. Really? Um, Maybe yeah, because so, you have a data center in yeah, your country. Yeah. Um, I think it's a lot to do with the work of my girlfriend, to be quite honest, <laughs> who is uh, one of the people who helps promote Office 365. Yeah. Um, there's a plug for Nicole. Um, so um, I think the, the local sub have done a lot of work uh, promoting Office 365 here. And I don't think it's anything to do with the placement of the data center. or you know, the, We know that this, the Europe North region is based in Dublin. I can't talk about specifics because of NDAs and stuff. Um, but it's not hard to find out where it is. A little bit of Googling or binging, should I say. <laughs> um, web searching. Yeah, web searching. <laughs> Using your favorite search engine, assuming it's not AOL, because you won't find anything there. Um, so, yeah, the, the placement, the, the location of a data center is irrelevant because in the end, when it comes to laws and legalities for just about everybody, um, things like the Patriot Act don't really care about the location of the mm. data center. And the other one? Uh... Now, there, there, there are always local laws about exporting data, of course. Yeah. Um, so we know certain countries are sensitive to that. And the other one is uh, in the that Netherlands? Sort of thing, it looks like the European Union. Sorry? And the other data center Sorry, in the Netherlands? Uh, so I think uh, Hans has yeah. also a lot of adoption of Office 365 in the Netherlands, or? Well, um, I, d I don't have much information about that because I'm more on the server side. <laughs> uh, but we, most of our um, customers are our hosters, so there is adoption of Windows Azure Pack, uh, the, the private version of Azure, and it, it, at the moment it's, it's still a little bit disconnected from the from the public Azure. Uh, hopefully, that will change in the near future. Uh, only very few cu uh, customers uh, go to only public Azure. They, they will still keep much of uh, their IT in, ho uh, in their own data centers. As, as Mark Rosinovich said, uh, the data center isn't going going away. It will stay. So the, 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 the focus is on com combined uh, private Azure and public Azure. Mm. And of course, the hosts want to sell their hosted version of Azure. Good thing that they all look the same. They, the, 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 the services are, are being matched. Uh, but we have a lot of work in, in that area. And that's because the, the hosts are really focused on, uh, on getting into the Microsoft uh, cloud. Yeah. Basically, that's what we're saying. We're, we're doing things in Azure, but uh, those are the applications we can make standalone that can live out there without too much of a uh, dependency on, of on, on the on-premise stuff. And that's why we're really interested in, in two things. And Express Route there seems to be indeed a very interesting evolution. If we can have an MPLS uh, extension straight into Azure and make it just part of our environment, that would be awesome. And then the second, second biggest drawback I still see is that for many of the applications that are not restful, we need 3 gigs so storage to have larger storage uh, capabilities in uh, infrastructure as a service and the cost needs to come down hmm. it really does because uh, uh, one, of, one of one of the main challenges we're, we're having is while you are playing with with doing things in azure at the moment and still having that large presence on premise is that you now start to have uh, you're not saving money at the moment, right? You have to invest in new stuff, and you still have to keep the old stuff running. And it would be nice to be able to have a more capable bandwidth pipe between the two, and just to to shift to where you need to be, and uh, make that feasible, payable, uh, let's say, affordable in uh, in, the, in the future. Hmm. So interesting things are happening, most definitely, yeah. Hmm. But as as, as uh, they both mentioned, on premise is not going away within a couple of years. It's going to take a bit longer than that. Yeah, guys, a question. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting when you listen to the guys from Whitman talk about here, they always talk about hybrid cloud. So they, this on-premise is staying around, and then what they want to do is extend into whether it be partner-hosted clouds or Azure. And so you have that choice of private, hosted public, 
or Azure Public Clouds. Um, I think that message gets lost when you talk to local Microsoft people who have specific sales targets to sell Azure. Um, they'll push Azure, 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 and completely forget the hybrid piece of the story. Yeah. Um, so it is it is definitely interesting there, and there's a certain phrase that uh, they were uh, Brad Anderson was using in the keynote, which is on ramp. So certain technologies that IT pros might see as being useful in that won't scare them, that won't replace anything that's local, and um, it will let or make things easier with local or reduced costs, like Azure Site Recovery. Um, Backup or, and cloud, things like that. Yeah. So we, you can extend your Compos and Pana or you know your data protection manager if you're using that. Or there's a few others that are able to extend into Azure. You can back up locally and back up into Azure so you can use that as your offsite storage. So you know, there's plenty of technologies there that don't necessarily mean you're gonna lift and shift your entire workload. And, and let's face it, none of us here would actually tell you to shift your entire server workload into Azure because you know it's not ready yet for that sort of thing. Basically, that's and that's there's specific true. use cases where it is superb. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the use cases will increase. And Makrosinovich made a very a nice comparison with a hockey stick, and he said uh, we are at the beginning of the hockey stick, uh, at the short end. Uh, they're expecting a really a lot, but they're not yet at the inflection point for mm -hmm. cloud migrations at all. But, but make it, well. The, the lot of we having a lot of conversations about this, but uh, we are seeing we are seeing the direct we are seeing the, uh, the the good good functionality in there, and by just using it, uh, you end up uh, migrating finally. And many of our customers haven't haven't even seen it yet, yeah. and that's the thing yeah. they want to uh, raise awareness, to show you yeah. some gateways into Azure that you know, open up your eyes to the technology. Yeah. So there was this Hyper-V Recovery Manager, I I guess. Is the name correct? Uh, what do you think about that? Hyper-V Site Recovery. No, Azure Site Recovery. Azure Site which Recovery. Which is based on Hyper-V Recovery yeah, Manager. Yeah. What do you think about that? It's I think it's cool that you now can replica to Azure, or in the future can replica to Azure. What do you think about that uh, that possibility? Will it open... Um, Azure as a uh, use case for small and medium customers or is it only a thing for uh, large enterprises? I think the latter. But Aiden uh, can talk about that one, I think. Yeah, so a few years ago Microsoft changed the licensing for System Center, which um, basically forces you to buy the entire bundle of System Center, which ruled out the small medium enterprise from purchasing the system center products. They in the past they would have bought something like VMM Workgroup for a few hundred euros for mm -hmm. five posts. And have to spend two hundred euros um per dual processor host. And that's a lot of money when you're talking to someone who has three hosts. And they're the perfect candidate for something like disaster recovery is a service where you are replicating virtual machines into a cloud like Azure. But unfortunately, they're being told that if you want to use this new Azure Site Recovery service, you need to be running Virtual Machine Manager on-premise um, for Hyper-V Recovery Manager to be able to hook into your private environment to coordinate the replication and the failover. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, I think Microsoft have put themselves into a catch-22. And the small medium enterprise who cannot afford Dior at the moment, but would look at Azure as a nice way to do Dior on a, on a budget, they can't afford System Center to do it. And then we have the larger enterprises who, for the most part, probably have already spent money on their secondary sites or want to keep their own dedicated secondary site. Um, and they're not going to look at it. I think Microsoft have missed a trick here with the breadth market, the small medium enterprise, which in our local market is 92% of businesses okay. uh, here in Ireland. Right. Some, sometimes I think as well that they, they, they think that if you don't, if you're not, if you're, if you're that small, you won't be, won't be willing 
complexities of exposing your web services on a secondary location, the, the IP addressing, the name resolution. And I think they, those people should be in the, the public cloud, basically. That's that's what I think that their, their mindset about that is. And, and for the bigger ones, I still find that uh, the replica stuff could use uh, a V3 or V2 version, right? So it's some enhancements to make it more more robust and less prone to something changes. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the limitations there. So, and I think again that express route, more bandwidth, will open lots more scenarios for people who have a, bit, a secondary site. And if it's cost effective and you have the bandwidth that you can now have my MPS to secondary disaster recovery site, it would become a lot more interesting in the future. Yeah. If you're starting to use VMM, of course. Yeah, but basically, even I think that's one. Of even with the express route, you will still still need the systems and the components. Mm. Yeah, and but 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 I think that might. I don't know. Do you guys think that the licensing on that might change in the future? I have no nope. clue. That's, I don't think so. Yeah. No, nope. we are. Um, they've been getting this number. feedback for two years now on System Center, yeah. um, and. They, they, the, the, the opinion, and Didier, you, you, you talked about it a little, and uh, the opinion from Edmund is that small medium enterprises, so companies with up to 200 users, have a small business server and should be in the cloud. That's Microsoft Redmond's opinion, yeah, but uh, I, I, which we I, know is, is not correct. <laughs> That's far from correct. I, I wonder At least not so, in Europe. So often, what is a small company? I wonder. Didier, how I mean, many employees has yeah. your company? I wonder. Well, you, you could say, uh, give, give or take, it goes up and down a bit, and there's the external people. But let's say, on average, 140. So, and you have a big how database. Much, how, many, how many compelling sounds have you got? Three. Multiple sites. With, I mean, with I mean, more than I one mean, petabyte, personnel, yeah? Personnel count, personnel count is the most ridiculous way of, of sizing up a company. I, I've known a company in Belgium that did... Uh, uh, the, uh, just in time delivery to the car industry. There were 15 or 20 people. They had multiple redundant sends because if they ever went down the delivery model to all those car factories and a just in time model, mm. for them it made perfect, perfect sense. It was very economically feasible to do that because they just couldn't afford not to be able to, de de to deliver the, the, the components. And then going to say, uh, how many, how many, what's your head count? Oh, 15 or 20 people. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. You should be, put your small business server in the cloud. That's so short, that's very short-sighted. Let's put it that yeah. way. Okay. So guys, we are 32 minutes into the showcast. Uh, maybe to wrap the things up, uh, we want to we want uh, have talked a little bit about Tech at 2014, mainly about the keynotes and uh, the, the things that were presented in the keynotes. So I want to ask you, what was your highlight at TechEd 2014, your personal highlight, uh, to wrap it up? Maybe, uh, Hans, you start. What was your personal highlight at TechEd 2014? Well, we went to TechEd with a couple of colleagues, and uh, one of them was Mark Mike. Uh, you may know him as the uh, of course. Mr. Web, uh, Mr. Mark guy. And he did a presentation on his first first day of TechEd. By the way, it was his first TechEd and he delivered three presentations. Yes. <laughs> he really <laughs> didn't realize what he was doing. <laughs> but he likes to make it. He got them. And, and I was most impressed, by the way, by the uh, presentation he did uh, on the Monday um, that was a one on the lessons learned designing the yeah. Windows Azure pack in the real world. That was really impressive. Uh, of course, uh, the Azure Pack team started off with a, a small uh, description of what Azure Pack was. That was Bradley Barts. And then when Mark took over, he really, he really built a complete uh, authentication uh, for Windows Azure Pack with, uh, with a tenant site um, uh, using the ADFS. Yeah. And it's such a, such a fantastic uh, demonstration. He even got an applause uh, at the end of one demo. Uh, yeah, the Azure Pack team, they were very content with what he did. And he was able to explain very complex stuff in, in, in a very easy manner. So that's my presentation of TechEd. 
That was your highlight. I saw the presentation and I yeah. was really amazed how cool he do, uh, does this uh, demo and everything went so smooth. And uh, uh, it, it, I think it was in, in front of a lot of uh, people. Huh? Yeah, it, I'm not sure. I think there were about four to 500 people cool. in there. It was quite a big room. It was one of the largest. Absolutely. Yeah, he, he did another presentation in a room for 1,300 people. He took a couple of pictures, and but he wasn't, so he just did it. <laughs> okay, uh, Didier, what? Yeah, he, he was, he was uh, amazing. Yeah. amazing. I saw the presentation. It was really good. Uh, Didier, what, what was your yeah. highlight in uh, at uh, Tech at 2014, North America? My, per my, my personal highlight, of course, was being on stage with Ben Armstrong. I mean, that was like... <laughs> cool to be able to do and get that opportunity and I was also very happy that, that we could show people that all that stuff we blog about you read about like on map ODX SMB3 direct that people really can use this in production and do use this and on the commodity hardware it is in there and if you have a if you have the hardware and if you have Windows 2012 or two start you that's what it's there for it's Fortune 500s, you know, 140. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, we use that. We can, we can leverage it. And it was cool to share that with people. <laughs> that it's not just for the for the big guys or a far from your from your environment show. No, no, it's in there. Use it. That was you have the right products, uh, mate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to choose my, the right my time. mom, my I mom tried this, yes, and and Karsten know this. Trust yeah. but verify. Yeah. <laughs> Never ever take a vendor's word for granted. Do your due diligence, because if you don't, if you just accept everything will work, everything is just fine, you might get bitten. Yeah. Yeah. So Aiden, your highlight. Let me guess. Um, <laughs> Maybe winning something? Well, obviously winning speaker idol was a big thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was a big thing, obviously. Um, but, you know, I enjoy meeting a lot of people at TechEd, um, getting to meet friends like yourselves um, and others as well. Um, I spent most of my time going to sessions on stuff that I didn't know yet. So it was interesting for me to learn about um, SMA, mm -hmm. so service management automation. Um, and that just reinforced the whole you know, need to learn PowerShell. And to be able to see what a technology like that can do um, its ability to reach out across your entire infrastructure and make change and automate that change. It's an interesting phrase that they were using there all by marketing to come up with a, a phrase, a motto, and the, the techies came up with that uh, if you go twice automate it. <laughs> and the, the lesson really is something repeatedly, it is worth investing some time to learn how to do it in PowerShell, create a workflow that is your SMA workbook imported in and use that to do the work instead of you wasting time doing the work over and over and over. So it was interesting for me to see that sort of technology because I'm, I'm not working Windows Azure Pack and the same way the hands is. I don't have that customer base. Um, so for me it was interesting to see that technology for the first time and say, okay, this is something that I need to learn more about. And it just reinforces the whole need for everybody to spend time learning PowerShell, as we've all known, because the cool stuff, the advanced stuff that we preach about and evangelize and blog about and write about, you know. Did you go to well, Seventy-five percent of it's driven by PowerShell. Did you Sorry. See Charles Joy sessions uh, on, on SMA. Um, I don't know who the guy was. He was a PFE, um, Premier Field Engineering. And uh, it was and, an interesting. And Anders Bengtsson, I think, uh, it was a session with Pete Pete Serger. Yeah. Uh, no. no? Okay. I didn't see that one. And the uh, the guy I saw, he was by himself. He was from Premier Field Engineering in Microsoft. And uh, it's a friend of mine uh, who works in PFE. I told him I was going to that session. He was like, "Oh yeah, that's going to be a brilliant session." And it was. Um, from the very foundation all the way through to explain each of the pieces. And then I went to an Azure orchestration session. Natural orchestration is SMA, but it's driven out of Azure. Mm. Um, all the, te the technology is the same. So it was interesting to see that as well. 
do orchestration as a service if you wanted from within Azure. And with your hybrid cloud, you could actually configure all your automation within Azure to actually automate the stuff on premise. So there's no need to deploy necessarily Windows Azure Pack or Orchestrator on premise to actually get the benefits of SMA. Um, you could run that stuff directly out of the cloud. So guys, and obviously pay Microsoft the yeah. privilege of doing so that. So guys, you are talking about SMA. We are talking about Windows Azure Pack. There's finally a lot of system center stuff uh, was at Tech at uh, 2014, but not the usual service manager orchestrator thing. The uh, the new things like uh, the Azure uh, Windows Azure Pack and uh, the um, SMA. I think I saw a lot of sessions about that. It, there, there's definitely a shift towards that sort of content. Um, it's being done is, and the way systems management is being done has changed quite. Mm -hmm. Our hands is, is dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. But if you look yeah, at when the me. first time we got him for us, if he could start developing for the IT pros. <laughs> if so you want to see where the action is, by stuff. the way, yeah. yeah. So Hans, what? You want to see where the if you want to see where the action is in uh, in that area, just take a look at the Windows Azure Pack Wiki. The, the, the largest section is on Windows, is on server management automation. Yeah, nice nice yeah, plot, really uh, Hans. But huge. you're right; it's a very great wiki with a lot of uh, useful information in it. I was there many times in the past weeks. So. Guys, we have we are 40 minutes into yeah. the showcast. Uh, I would like to thank you all that we found the time to do this experiment. Four of us on one screen. We will see how it how it, it will be finally. Uh, there was a little bit glitch in the audio, but I think the thing the thing um, went well, and uh, I hope uh, we can do that again uh, in the next months. What do you think? Sure. Yeah, certainly. Like <laughs> we'll, we'll find a time. We will find a time. We'll we will find a four-hour window to deal with the technical difficulties. <laughs> oh, it was only two hours, eh? <laughs> you are so nice, guy. <laughs> so uh, I wish you uh, uh, a, a lovely weekend and see you soon. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, maybe in Barcelona or the week after Barcelona. The week after Barcelona. <laughs> Almost forgiven for yeah. me, right? Okay. Bye, guys. Yes, for me, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See you, guys. Bye, Bye everyone. Guys. Bye.